notion of Dark Castle Pictures is that when you look what Bill Castle was doing, he was making essentially one set movies. And he really had, you know, at, at for his time, very advanced visual effects. And he had great marketing and promotional activities because he was very aware of all that. So we try to find movies that work in, it, 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 essentially for all those aesthetics. This film is based on a, on a 1960s 3D film when you actually had to wear glasses. Bill Castle to the eye doctor one day and he, they had that, you know, it was new, that kind of goofy thing that you put on where they kept turning the lenses and he said, wow, what if you could see ghosts through those things, you know? So that's where the idea came from. You only could see the ghosts if you wore special glasses and of course Bill Castle took that, you know, to its logical, well, or illogical extension and he actually had three-dimensional glasses in the theater. The audience would wear 3D glasses to see the spirits. They're there. This thing just stirs them up. That's the best kind of ghost story. Which we've actually incorporated into the movie rather than giving people, viewers, to see what's going on. In this version, the characters in the movie actually have to don these special glasses in order to be able to see the spirit world and what's going on there. Uh, William Castle was a very interesting filmmaker for the for the simple sake that he was always into some gimmick to bring people into the theater. I wanted to bring a little bit of that fun back into this film too. So our our cast members do don the glasses when they're supposed to look for the ghost. What we wanted to change, of course, we wanted to contemporize the story. We wanted to bring a little bit more of the current editing styles, so it does become a, a far more a dimensional experience. Think about what you're saying. There's no such thing as ghosts. It has a very contemporary slant. We change the story, we update it, and we we use you know, the highest end of you know highest you know state of the art visual effects. Bob and I just love these movies, so we try to make them fun and exciting. Howard Berger is our um, is our special makeup effects uh, guy, and he's unbelievable. And Steve Beck, our director, gave Howard the um, the tools and the palette to create whatever he wanted to create. When I was first approached to do um, this movie, Steve came down to the studio, to K&B Effects, and uh, we met and went through everything, and we kind of talked about what each ghost is and all that. And what I found interesting right off the bat and what it, what really intrigued me was that Steve wasn't looking at him like, okay, there's weird guy number one and weird guy number two. He had a backstory for everybody. And that kind of helped us design some things. We had a, an artist hired by KNB down in Los Angeles, and uh, we did some comic book style artwork. Really very broad concept. The realist uh, aspect that you see in a lot of horror movies is thrown right out here. We're sort of tweaking on people's uh, worst nightmares. It's a way you've never seen ghosts before. You've never quite seen them like this. Because at first when I read it, I'm like, ah, you know, it's probably going to be 400 days of blue screen with ghosts. Like, going, oh, I'm going to get you. And so he said, we're not doing that. They are there on the set. You know, they're physically there. I thought, okay, that's going to be cool. Based on that, Steve really liked that stuff, and then he took it and did some design work, some maquettes, and what maquettes are, they're little clay sculptures that represent what the character could look like, so that the director can look, him, look at them from all angles. Some of the makeups allowed us to play a little bit and actually design on the set, uh, do some makeups, march the actor in, have the director look at them, we roll some fo footage, uh, have a look at them on, on uh, camera in our dailies decide what we liked and what we didn't like, and redesign as we went. So we went ahead and did that, and Steve signed off on all of them. It was like, yeah, this is great, this is great, this is great. And from there, did some color tests, painting up the heads and all that stuff. As you can see, I'm just adding detail with an airbrush to texturize it. You can see all this little dotting technique we have, and then we also highlight the structure, the shadow, and the highlight of the makeup. You can see I'm finding all the three-dimensional structure and just trying to highlight a little bit. Breaker came in, I think we started John about uh, 4 o'clock this morning. It's a pretty intense process to take one of these actors and turn them into a monster. John's makeup is about uh, three hours, I'd say, total, three and a half. So it ranges. We have makeups that, like I said, take uh, can take an hour, and then we have a makeup that takes like four hours. I think I'm the longest. It takes four to five hours to do my makeup because I have scars everywhere. 
I have slashed myself with a knife. So far I've done a bathroom scene with Shannon Elizabeth where she's come in the bathroom but she doesn't know I'm there. Is it too scary? I mean, you know, it's really scary. And uh, he's got a full foam bodysuit on. I know this looks like a bunch of little pieces glued on, but this entire thing is rubber. Uh, right up to here. He's no and then he's got a piece that goes on uh, the neck and the lower part of the face. He's got ear pieces on. He's got a forehead that encompasses the eyes and the nose. An upper lip piece, a chin piece that encompasses the chin, and then he's also got hands that glue on separate and blend off onto the uh, bodysuit. The more you do one character, the quicker you get. So when we, uh, for Hammer, for instance, uh, it initially took us four hours the first time, and now we have it down to, um, I think, about two hours. So that's pretty good. We bloody him up and we sweat him all down, and Steve wants everything really wet. He keeps going, juicy, make it juicy. I'm like, okay, juicy, here it comes. You know, and spritz these guys and cover them in KY blood and all that stuff. You know, some of them have contact lenses, so their eyes are all kind of crazy. I'm the uh, contact lens technician, and as part of the costume, uh, we put the contact lenses on the eyes and change the eye color. They don't have any power in them. They're just, uh, just a cosmetic lens. In her case, she's got her contact lenses on, and we're putting this over top. It was fighting me, but we got it. Oh my God! I hate it when they do that! Something Steve always said, it's got to be scary. It's got to be scary. It cannot be funny. And it's real hard, because there's very little that scare people. Uh, what we're doing, we're doing what's called a float-off in the business. Really now, really Essentially, now. the area that's glued onto the face, all of those prosthetics are disposable, fully disposable. They get thrown away in the garbage and then we use a new pair tomorrow. Sleep is for beginners. He was here at 4, I was here at 3.30. Yep. Started, when do you think you'll finish your day here, Charles? Oh, I'm going to guess another 20 minutes. Thanks oh. for coming. Bye-bye. The idea in this movie was to not have a conventional haunted house, you know, a, an old house with dark corridors. The house is all glass. It is completely, you can see through every wall of the house. I've always liked uh, houses partly in construction. We don't have walls and things like that, and I incorporated that into the design of this. So when you walk around the house, obviously you just see these pillars holding up the house, and uh, you see right across to the other rooms. Guess Uncle Cyrus wasn't too keen on privacy. I sure hope the bathroom's in the basement. The feel of the film, visually, is really important to the audience. They, they get a whole character feeling for this house, which is uh, uh, moving and it's almost alive. If you, for example, went up a staircase, well, two minutes later, that staircase would not be there. It would actually be facing in a different direction. So everything is moving. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like a three-dimensional maze. So the characters in the story are, are constantly trying to get their bearings and unravel this, this puzzle. And for an actor, by the end of the day, your brain is just kind of 
cooked. Where normally you have a crickety old house up on a hill somewhere, this is uh, state of the art, um, glass, you can see everything. And within that, you see the ghosts from all angles. The first thought that came to my mind when I saw the house was, who took the time to inscribe all of that Latin on the wall? <laughs> Just so we all clear, Miss Maggie does not do windows, OK? The writing on the walls is from, the, there's a book in the film, it's very important, called The Arcanum. And in the book, it has all these writings and, uh, and drawings and sketches. And um, we incorporated that into the set, into the walls, and they serve as uh, a, a trap device for the ghost. The ghost can't break through the walls because of the etching. It's Come on out now, pal. Robert, stop screwing around. Hey, Glass family, Robinson, you're wasting your breath. This is ectobar glass. He's not going to hear you. See, this is shatterproof and soundproof. So what are these? That, that's a little harder to explain. Uh, they're containment spells. See, ghosts can't cross those. Ghosts? Yes, ghosts. This is the first set that we know of in the history of cinema that's been an entire glass house. Difficult to shoot something like that for the cinematographer. Now, one of the opportunities was the ability to shoot through walls and walls and layers upon layers and kind of give us a, a really multi-textured kind of visual statement with the house. The other problem, though, is, of course, we could see all the way through the house and all the way to the other side where people were standing around and, you know, having coffee and donuts. So we had to be very careful about how we arranged our camera and how things were reflected, which was possibly our major issue. For anybody that's not actually on the set working, that you're not cast, you're anyone else around the set, you have to wear all dark colors. I mean, you'll have a reflection here from something way over here, and you, you try to find out what it's from. And, and so we try and have uh, most of the crew wearing dark clothing. But, I mean, you can only have so many black shirts and pants. Everyone has to, to cover up, stay dark, don't move. You know, there's a lot going on. When you're making a movie, with, is it when you're having reflections, it's horrible because you have reflections. You can't see the crew. You can't see the cameraman. You can't see the camera. So you have to always have to be off axis a little bit so you can't really see everything. And it was, you know, not easy. But, you know, we did it. And it's worth it. Shooting the movie, the, as we say in The Matrix, it's the initial capture. It's the first image that you take, you know, and, and when you initially capture the image, then you add everything to it. Our visual effects aren't so much based on um, visually manipulating an image. They're more or less adding production value to things that are best gone through in a visual effects form. Uh, for example, this house is powered by an immense machine in the basement. You can never build that machine in reality. Uh, so we're having to go to computer graphics to construct it. Uh, my name is Michael Fink, and I'm the senior visual effects supervisor at Cinesite. In the case of 13 Ghosts, uh, almost every shot was integrating a, a 3D element, three-dimensional element, with a, a pre-photographed plate. When we're talking about 3D elements, we're talking about elements that can be seen from all sides, that can move in all directions. The 3D process involves creating a model. At the same time, shaders are developed that take the textures and apply them to the model. Then it gets animated and lit. After we've created the element, made sure the match move works, and the textures stick to the model and don't go anywhere else, and then the lighting matches, then it's up to the compositors, after all of those elements are rendered, put the shot together. This is the background plate that was shot on location. As you see, there's not much to it, just a little bit of moving doors. So what I would do when I, after this gets scanned, I would bring this into the computer and color correct this as best as possible, and then send that to the 3D lighter so they have something really nice to match to the 3D lighting ones. So then the 3D guys deliver the CG element. I would extract it off of this black frame and actually put it onto that background. Our 3D guys also went in and they built 3D glows so that the rings and all the little tiny rings and the lights at the top of the clockworks have this really nice glow. Even though we look at something as, as a unit, the machine, the clockworks, it's made up of many different parts. The door element was a live action piece that was shot on location as well that I was responsible for extracting off this black piece of cloth. Our guys downstairs in the roto department will actually hand draw frame by frame shapes so we can extract something off an image and put it onto another image. And then we would come to the green screen and I would extract her off the green screen, making sure that I keep all the nice edge detail. Once I get all the elements together, I'll bring them in, I'll layer them in the correct order, maybe fine tune their edges a little bit more, put them all together for the final render. We would end up with a shot like this. The 
the challenge in creating a practical modeled element is that you want the element to look properly set into the scene, which means that you really have to take care to make sure that the lighting, the shadows, the highlights, the, the atmosphere, all that stuff matches the photograph plate so that the two images look like they're all one and one doesn't look like just postage stamp on top. The house was very um, hard to match because again you're looking at a real physical presence on the first floor and for some of the shots we built the second floor. When they went out on location to show the bigger view of the house both stories they actually didn't have anything out there it was just a piece of grass so that's why you would see the light here for the the grass interaction from the house. This is the actual 3D house very complex a lot of 3D tracking, the camera has a nice tilt on it. The matching of the CG part of the house to the live action part, in terms of matching lighting is one trick, but to match its position so that as the camera moves, it doesn't slide against the house, the real part of the house, is a pretty difficult task. 3D trackers will do their track and then they'll pass that, what they call that camera, onto the lighter and the animators, so then they know what they're dealing with. Then the lighter will fully light the object using different lights and then the animator had to move each and every one of these individual panels. Here's what we call a Z-depth mat. Now the purpose of the Z-depth mat is you can see how it's, there's a dark red back here and a much more intense red here. This gives us flexibility to blur objects in the house or color objects in the house depending on the brightness of that red value. These are the 3D light fixtures. This is one of our mist layers that went over the house. Shot like this from beginning to end, from like full development to the final, it probably took about a couple months. It's kind of mind boggling. And that all leads to the final composite of this. It's time to leave. I'll take your word for it. Initially, when we when we received the movie, we had first thought that it was ghosts. You think of ghosts as traditional transparent um, images floating and stuff, but this was more like Sixth Sense, Beetlejuice type of ghosts. But one ghost did need a um, little help. We uh, received this film frame, and basically they had the stunt uh, stunt man wear a black uh, head, so that allowed us to withhold information behind. And so what we did was cut out his head and replace it with a neck. This neck is 3D. It's fully CG here. We created the whole thing. It's very gross. We had uh, several people uh, that didn't even want to come close to, to working on that part, but uh, I, I felt fine with it. The torso. We had little time and a huge amount of work to, uh, to accomplish, and I think we uh, I'm pretty happy. I think we delivered to our audience something that they really want to see. It's not a really fun, scary movie. Yeah. It's a really a, a, a incredible ride, and the music and the visual effects and uh, and the actors all help us get through it. And it's it's really uh, I'm I'm really proud of it.